Hello and welcome, I'm Tarek Basley and this is Downstream, the week's top stories from the world of science and technology on Al Jazeera. This week, why artists and innovators are attending one of the world's top telco events, we meet two women in Senegal who have got themselves technical qualifications and have set up their own garage, and a new era of space exploration or NASA's final gasp, we look at the launch of Orion. But first, I'm bringing you this week's show from the Qatar National Convention Centre, where the International Telecommunications Union, the UN body uh, with the job of looking after telecommunications around the world, has been meeting this week. One of the things they've done this week is launch a index, a global index of cyber security, looking at how governments around the world are dealing with the global security threat online. Uh, Stuart. Carl Law from ABI Research joins me now. Tell me, what was the purpose of this index and why has it taken us so long to bring this information together? Well, th that's a really good question to start with. The, the goal of the index is actually to raise awareness of countries' individual commitment to cybersecurity. It, it's, it's not about measuring how effective countries are at um, dealing with cybersecurity threats. It's really a measure of their commitment to actually improving the global perspective on cybersecurity. And the reason it's taken so hard is really there's 193 member states of the ITU and we've had to go to every one of those 193 states and assess them on five key measures. Legal measures, operational, uh, technical measures, capacity building and cooperation. So as you can imagine, that's taken a, a, a distinct period of time to actually get to a meaningful rating for them. Uh, so what did you find? Were there any surprises? Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting mix because uh, the, I would highlight probably two things. First of all, Malaysia has come really high up in the rankings. And secondarily, if you look at the African region alone, uh, Mauritius came first. Uh, countries you would not usually ascribe to being leaders in cybersecurity actually are up there with, with the big nations such as United States and uh, Canada, for example. So what is it they're doing that's right? Well, they're, they're instituting a lot of good practice around capacity building, so actually certifying more professionals in the art of cybersecurity uh, as, as one measure. And secondarily, they have very strong legal presence. So if you think about a democratized web environment where you're only as strong as your weakest link from a country perspective, they're actually doing a lot of work on creating a legal framework where they can support cyber uh, legislation and cyber crime on child online protection and, and industrial espionage, things like that. Well, from security to innovation, and one of the stalls at this year's conference invited a whole lot of young innovators and inventors along to show off some of their visions for the future. Take a look at this. Art and technology in one. This smart wall reshapes itself in response to the environment, in this case a change in light. Can you imagine if you can uh, change it with a big structure that can open or close depending on weather conditions? sounds, pressure, humidity or even light, that would be something completely different, fluid, dynamic. At conferences like these the focus is frequently on big business, the companies that make telecommunications around the world possible. But this year a number of young innovators have been invited along and been given a platform to share their vision. From this bio machine which uses living plants as sensors to this orb an original approach for clearing landmines, a new generation is exploring the way technology can shape the future. And that future might just start like this, a Dutch project which shows how plastic cups can be transformed into other objects using a 3D printer. It's still a prototype, but its designers say the technology has enormous potential. That's what the 3D printer is so good for, you can uh, use waste on site to make new products again uh, for something that you're doing on site. So you're using local waste for local needs. Also on display, an automatic algae farm that cleans water, generates oxygen and can provide food. And the big companies attending are interested, curious to see how artists and innovators are using new technology. So not only to use it as, um, as, uh, as consumers, but more to think how it could be used in other ways. And this kind of thinking and alternatives, I think this is what artists and creative people in general, um, this, this is a capacity that they have. And um, this is why we are presenting them and why they should inspire artists to do the same. Roboy is the world's first robot designed around human anatomy, using tendons and muscles rather than motors to move. 
and we can actually learn a lot from nature, it doesn't mean that we have to stick to what nature has done. You know, we are engineers, we can use other things, we can use other materials, but I think it's a great source of inspiration. Roboy uses artificial intelligence, a learning technology many say will shape the way we communicate in future. But for now, it helps Roboy learn how to move. He's also a fast learner when it comes to knowing what to say and when. Al Jazeera, Doha. Well, this week we saw the successful launch of NASA's Orion spacecraft. It was a test launch of the capsule which is designed to carry humans, astronauts, possibly into deep space. And it flew further and faster than any capsule designed for humans ever has. Well, my colleague Andy Gallagher followed the launch from Cape Canaveral. Three, two, one. It was a textbook launch and a spectacular sight. Launched by the most powerful rockets in the US fleet, this is one of the most anticipated space programs in decades. Hundreds of onlookers came to watch what NASA says is the beginning of a new era. As it left the Earth's atmosphere, Orion climbed to an orbit of 6,000 kilometers, going through a series of vital stress tests. We have separation. A good separation of the port and starboard boosters. This may be an unmanned mission, but for NASA it's considered a crucial step in deep space exploration. Engineers hope in years to come this craft will take astronauts to near-Earth asteroids and Mars. Now we're going out to a different planet, and that brings a lot of challenges, both technical and human. And that's what's so exciting about this new era. At four and a half hours, it was a short mission. Orion orbited the Earth twice before going through one of its most critical tests. As the craft re-entered the atmosphere, its shields were superheated, and finally parachutes were deployed before splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. In terms of a maiden voyage, NASA says things couldn't have gone better. It's an amazing vehicle, and the fact that it went so well is a testament to the workforce that put in so many, har so many hours and years of hard work to, to make this uh, work well. For NASA, this was a flawless start to what will be a long and ambitious program. Over the next few months, engineers will pour over all the data, but they say this is a milestone. There'll be another unmanned test flight in about two years. After that, astronauts will board Orion and venture into deep space. One engineer described Orion as a craft built to perfection, and it now carries with it the hope that taking humans into deep space is possible. Well, the Orion space capsule was built by Lockheed Martin, and that's caused many commentators to question the future of the NASA itself. They're saying, is this the last gasp of NASA? It's farmed all its important work out to corporate and private companies, or is it a project which is going to lead the administration forward in the years ahead? We spent a lot of time with the space shuttle in low Earth orbit. And that frankly drained a lot of enthusiasm for space travel and exploration uh, inside the agency and out. And now uh, the idea is to move beyond and do what a lot of people way back when hoped NASA would do, which is press on and explore and stay on distant bodies, the moon and Mars. It's trying to do that, but it's lost a lot of its support along the way and doesn't have the budgetary support by any means to do it. And so it's an agency that is... Um, uh, hobbled by uh, politics and bureaucracy uh, and is trying to recapture some of the magic it had in 1969 and it's not easy to do. Well throughout the week in the Peruvian capital Lima the United Nations climate change talks have gone on. One of the big issues of course is global warming and what can be done to prevent it. My colleague Nick Clark, our environment editor, is in Peru, not at the talks in Lima, but he's been in the tropical rainforests there, where logging continues apace. It is a long way from the high Andes to the Amazon basin, I can tell you. It is hot and sweltering here. This part of the trip, we're going to be focusing on deforestation, big issue as far as global warming is concerned, big issue as far as the climate change conference uh, in Lima is concerned. In fact, this morning I took a flight out around Pucallpa, just checking out the lie of the land, and it was pretty distressing what we could see. You'll fly over dense areas of canopy, and then there'll be a line of demarcation, which marks the point at which there is complete devastation. Just land stripped bare, or palm oil plantations stretching as far as the eye can see. Pucalpa is a big center for the timber trade, a big center for the illegal timber trade. In fact, it defies belief what's going on here. 
Illegal logging is so commonplace in the rainforest, the Romulo Sangan doesn't care about us filming him doing what he does. Stealing trees from forbidden areas with impunity. It's illegal. It is illegal. We shouldn't really be doing this. The police make us do all this paperwork and you have to pay them off. They're constantly putting up obstacles. And this is where Romulo's trees go. Three hours boat ride away, the sawmills of the town of Pucalpa. Much of the timber ends up in the US and China. Trees 100 years old and more destined to become someone's hardwood floor or garden table. The logging trade here is a world of forged documents and faked inventories and it is on a massive scale. Indeed the World Bank estimates that 80% of Peru's total timber exports are harvested illegally. That is 8 out of 10 of these trees illicit. One after the other, Pucalpa's sawmills stretch three kilometers along the riverbank. Trees supposedly taken legally from concessions, but in fact cut from protected forest. These markings are official codes for permits that the forestry authorities give out to transport and sell wood. And they're all fictitious? Yes, mostly they're fictitious. The Independent Environmental Investigation Agency found that the forging of paperwork and corruption is endemic. Nobody has been sanctioned for this. None of the people, and we have all the names of the people that were involved in producing the fake inventories, in approving the fake inventories, in approving the, 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 the mobilization of all this timber, nobody has been investigated. Illegal logging on this scale is very bad news for global warming. Living trees suck up CO2 to survive, helping alleviate carbon emissions. But this, of course, has entirely the opposite effect. And here we are, a little more than an hour's flight from the Climate Change Conference in Lima. Well, scarcely a week goes by without reports of fresh hacking. This theft of personal identity details, names, phone numbers, credit card numbers, that type of material from online accounts. But another side of this issue, which is seldom covered, is what is publicly available, what we put up there ourselves on social sites, and what those with bad intentions can do with that information. Jacob Ward takes a look at the issue from San Francisco. There are a certain number of hackers who know how to get sensitive information out of a database. They have the, the patience and the skills to find vulnerabilities in a system, to plant malicious code, and to comb through the results for what they need. It's very expert work, and that's how a seemingly endless stream of credit cards and social security numbers are compromised each year. But a more common kind of hacker engages in an easier form of the craft, what security experts call social engineering. They use the information that you and I volunteer on the web every day through sites like Facebook and Twitter to find targets and trick them into turning over the information necessary to reset passwords and gain login credentials. That is why the FBI is urging military personnel to scrub their social media accounts of information that might reveal details of their duty status, their deployment plans, or anything else that might make them a target. The trouble is, social media is built to get this kind of information out of all of us. Not only does Facebook, for instance, seek to compile the deepest possible dossier on you and the names of your kids and what you do for a living, the third-party services that use Facebook as a login credential also want to share information like your travel itinerary, as in the case of, of TripIt, or where you are at any given moment, as is true of Foursquare. With just a small amount of that kind of information, a little social engineering goes a long way. In May of this year, the security service iSight Partners revealed a long-running scam that seemed to originate in Iran, in which hackers used social media to get information about some 2,000 diplomatic, military, and intelligence personnel. They impersonated a news organization to try to get that information out of them, including login credentials. 
And in some cases, companies are fooled into turning over information as well. Some companies use the last four digits of a credit card and a billing address to verify your identity, while other companies and services cough up that information if you ask them the right questions. This is diabolical stuff, and what makes it sort of all the more diabolical is that it doesn't take a trained coder to get it done. It just takes someone with enough charm and creativity to get inside the life that we are all increasingly posting online. Well, throughout the world, educators and technology companies face the challenge of bringing women into their workforces. It's an industry often dominated by men. Well, here's a story from Senegal about two sisters who got their technical training and set up their own garage, despite many obstacles. Here's Nick Hack. Fatou Kamara and Fatou Sila are sisters and business partners. Together, they opened what they describe as the first car repair shop in Senegal, operated by women. Fatou Fatou Mercedes specializes in luxury vehicles. There aren't that many new ones in Dakar, but there are plenty of older models in need of repair. There are lots of car garages in Dakar, but few are reliable. We saw an opportunity in the market. We're certified mechanics and there aren't that many in town. The sisters have a growing number of regular customers. It's irrelevant that they are women. I want the job to be done properly and quickly. All of the cars here are brought in from Europe or North America. Finding parts is difficult. So when it comes to fixing cars, the sisters can't just replace what's broken, they have to actually mend the broken parts. And that takes quite a lot of skills. Fatou and Fatou attended this technical school. Students are trained specifically to deal with engine problems found in West Africa. Girls do much better than boys on this course, but there aren't enough of them taking up this training. Here in Senegal, women are traditionally expected to bear children. Few are encouraged to work, let alone start their own business. But the sister's father, who is the imam of one of the city's biggest mosques, believes times are changing. I am so proud of them. Of course young girls should continue to pursue training and work. It's our religious duty as parents to ensure they do and follow the right path. The sisters admit running a garage is not always easy, but they support each other, and it helps that their father does too. Nicholas Hawk, Al Jazeera, Dakar. To India now and a project that's using cheap plastic sheeting to help save the lives of premature babies. It's been found that these sheets regulate the temperature of the babies long enough to allow them to get through those difficult few weeks at the beginning of their lives. Here's Victoria Gattenby. Born weeks ahead of his due date, this baby boy is being wrapped in a polythene sheet to keep him warm. Premature babies are prone to hypothermia, which can be life-threatening. If you use a polythene wrap and a cloth, probably we are giving a better chance to the baby to survive. Probably better chance for the baby to maintain temperature. Probably better chance for the baby to maintain the sugar. Most premature babies born in India are still only wrapped in a sterile cloth before they're transferred to an intensive care unit. And many don't survive the journey. In our country, neonatal mortality is very high. Almost 20 to 25 percent of neonates dying throughout the world are from India. A new study by doctors at Saraya Hospital in Mumbai has found that babies wrapped in polythene maintain a significantly higher body temperature than those wrapped in cloth. In India, a sheet of plastic large enough to wrap a baby costs less than the equivalent of one US dollar. Doctors say the method could make a real difference to babies born in rural areas. I think potentially the use of simple sterile polythene sheeting um, could be applied to many, many countries. But then I don't want it to give false hope to people. And I think there are so many other needs that a preterm baby has. I don't think having just one centralized facility, for example, in a country, and then just using polythene sheeting everywhere else is gonna answer the many, many problems that there are. UNICEF says India's made significant progress in reducing child mortality over the last 20 years, but much more needs to be done. Almost 3% of all premature babies born every year in India still die. Doctors hope this treatment method will help more babies survive. Well, that's all I have for you now. If you've enjoyed watching this video, please do share it. You can also get more on all these stories on our website, aljazeera.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Tarek Basley. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye.